hey guys welcome back to my youtube channel so today i'm going through a part only a part of the historical process because that's just that's what that's that's just a long 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 it's a quite bulky topic or yeah quite bulky there's no or to it the, the thing it's a fat book i wonder what they're going on with so today I'll only be going through the migration and settlement into the Caribbean region. And that includes when you had the indigenous people or the Amerindians coming, the Europeans, the Africans, and the Asians, right? All of them came at different periods in time. Now, before we go into all of that, you probably will hear or have heard this saying, history is written by the victors, all right? So, there are many periods in Caribbean history and the events in history of the, of the Caribbean, the events of the history of the Caribbean, they're written from an ethnocentric perspective they're written from mainly the blacks perspective but how but they are saturated with eurocentric viewers they're saturated with the views or this how the story was told by the the europeans so by learning the historical process we'll be able to understand how these processes have influenced the cultural and societal development of the Caribbean. Now, going back to, you know, this main point, history being written by the victors, history being written by the winners. It is possible, you know, that the Vikings had found the Caribbean before the Spanish and the English as they started sailing west across the Atlantic in about the 8th century. And you've probably heard this name before, Leif er Erikson. Now, he was a Norse explorer, Norse meaning, you know, Viking, and he was from Iceland and it was thought that he was would have been or is the first known European to set foot on the North American continent years before Columbus made it to you know the new world however history is not necessarily entire entirely fact and it is from the interpretation of the winners that it is told the ones who were more prominent the ones who dominated the different areas of history all right so when we're speaking about migration and settlement we're going to talk about the pre-columbian era or the pre-columbian period to around 1838 and 1838 is a prominent time for the british colonies now the pre-columbian period speaks about the period before Columbian arrived to the caribbean right so that's before 1492 and that when we're talking about about the pre-Columbian period, we're going as far back as the Ice Age. The Ice Age was the period of extreme cold temperature that was relatively fit for survival. So you had a lot of movement around, right? People had to be moving from where they were now in order to find food and proper grounds for living. You know, you need food, you need warmth, you also need shelter and the place wasn't really fit for shelter so the nomadic people needed to find suitable ground for planting to feed themselves as well as their animals and it was also a constant struggle because the animals that they fed on were constantly moving around or migrating as well in order to feed themselves so you see how this thing working out not really a fit situation for anybody at all 
And the nomadic people, the Amerind who later became called the Amerindians, crossed the Bering Strait with those animals that they needed. All right. I think the cartoon Ice Age covers this so well because they hunted mammoths, stuff like that. And Manny, the central character in Ice Age, was a mammoth. And he was migrating, I am guessing, across the Bering Strait. You know that now that I'm old and thinking about the cartoon, that's what I'm I'm getting from it. I haven't rewatched it since I've watched it, you know, when I was smaller, but thinking about it, I'm like, oh, I'm getting the point of this now. It's not some just travel, you know? So, yeah. So, I'd give Ice Age another look, you know? No, the Bering Strait. The Bering Strait was an area of frozen land it was a land bridge that allowed the nobody people or the amerindians to cross over from a from the asian continent to the north american continent where they're where they're clo um at their closest points so at that point it was russia real being really close to alaska and that frozen land bridge allowed them to cross over from russia to alaska and that's why the Bering Strait was also known as Beringia, which is a Russian word, right? The migration process was a lengthy one for these Amerindians because even though it looks like a short distance, they had to walk far and they didn't have cars and those modes of transport. So, you know, the only way of transport is by either boat or by foot. And we don't see really them introducing much sailing until they actually got into the um got to north south north and south america now the ones that stayed in north america and moved to the united states became caught became native americans and they were later divided into different tribes who resided in different states in the united states Um, we had the Taino people, we had the Cam Caribs, the Kalinag or Kalinagos, they're called Caribs or Kalinagos. Also saw the Mayans who went who stayed in Central America, so like Mexico and Belize. You also had the Incas who went down to the South American continent far, far, far from where the Tainos would be, into Peru. So that's where the um the Incas stayed in Peru. We had the Tainos now and the Caribs that moved along the South American continent and moved into the islands of the Lesser Antilles and the Greater Antilles. Alright? So, as I said, the Amerindians had spread over a vast area of the different continents. Uh, they occupied North America, Central and South America. But eventually, the Tainos moved along the Orinoco River. That's like most of the river is in venezuela but a part of it is in colombia as well but they moved along the orinoco river in venezuela into the lesser antilles and ultimately into the greater antilles said that the tainos did not stay in the lesser antilles because they were often harassed by the caribs or the kalinagos or the kalinago people all right they were harassed by them the Tainos were seen as peaceful people. However, the Kalinagos, on the other hand, were warlike. So they're very hostile. The Taino got hostile at times, you know, but when provoked. So the Taino people were led by a religious leader called a cacique. And they had a very effective or a social organization where the women did the farming, the light work, you know, while the men did the hunting, hunting of animals for food. The Taino worshipped um, Zemi, okay, and they ate seafood, mainly seafood, because they resided near the coast or closer to the coastal areas. Also, they stayed near the coast in order to see incoming trouble.
let's say that because they weren't they didn't have like a military setup like the Kalinagos. The Kalinagos were more warlike, so of course their setup would be always on the go, always ready for always ready for to fight, to raid, stuff like that. The Kalinagos were not like that in a watch war. So they had to keep an eye out. So if they were more inland, they wouldn't be able to see when trouble was coming and they would always be caught by surprise. But seeing that they stayed near the coast, they could see incoming ships, stuff like that, incoming boats. Um, and the boats, the Kalinagas used, let me see if I can remember this, called Piragas, the, the war canoes. See, they even have war canoes. They had a war chief as well, the Kalinagos. So you'll see where, when I get to the Kalinagos, that they had a military setup as opposed to the Tainos. They built their house, houses out of what they had around, like on, on hand resources, like thatch and straw. They made their tools for hunting like spears and bows themselves using stones and other material. And they also had a patriarchal um, social organization. The, the affairs of the family were controlled by the males. You can say that. Right? Now the Kalinagos or the Carib, the, they were... All, they too came, you know, and they were spread along the North American, Central American, and South American continent. However, they moved into the Lesser Antilles, all right? M mm, one of the main reasons, too, for all this migration was that, you know, being settled in a place for a while, of course, there will be reproduction, so the population is going to get... Uh, denser and eventually the space there could not hold everybody i can't have everybody there so you have to spread out so that that's one of the other reasons for the movement into the caribbean um the kalinago people as i said were characterized as warlike people the men and the women live separately and the you'd see where the Kalinago people would raid the Taino villages, steal their food, and even their women. I just said steal their women. Not like take Jamaica, not like Jamaican steal women. They kidnapped the women. And they, they took them against their will to wherever they stayed, back to their village. All right. They were led by the Obutu, and that was their chief leader, and. Um, they had a war chief called the boys and they have they believed in they were spiritual and they believed in an evil spirit called maboya and they made their houses out of thatch and straw as well they used what they had on hand The Tainos and the Kalinagos, both of them resided in Puerto Rico and Trinidad. Those are the only two islands or countries, sorry, that I know that the, Talina the Kalinago people and the Tainos stayed on at the same time. Now there's the introduction of the uh, um the Europeans into the Caribbean region. Now I have Treaty of Tordesillas here because this played a major role into how things happened as per whether Spain or Portugal would get most of the Caribbean region. And you'll see in history where we had more Spanish conquistadors than Portuguese and you'll see why now christopher columbus had uh, had his methods there is always he's he was italian by the way he was italian i saw in a book that he was portuguese that's incorrect he was italian he was born in genoa italy now spain and portugal 
sit on the Iberian Peninsula. So there is something known even today as the Iberian rivalry. If you, if you type it into Google today, you're going to see something about football coming up um, to determine which, which team is the better team of, sport, of Spain sorry, and Portugal. But this Iberian pending, um, not this Iberian rivalry, sorry, stems from more than just football. In all affairs, Spain and Portugal is always competing to see which is the better country. Now, Portugal and Spain needed to get to Asia in order to complete their, you know trading transactions you know they needed to trade simple enough portugal um s continued to sail along the coast of africa around the cape of good hope uh, in order to get to asia I mean, I know how Christopher Columbus come mix up himself into this but Christopher Columbus he wanted fame he wanted fortune he wanted a title he wanted to be that man where he say hey i have some business but i don't know which man to call to do it and you, you say hey call christopher columbus call columbus he's your man to do that job christopher wanted to be that person would we call him a gunner though i don't know no so Christopher wanted didn't want to follow Portugal, right? Or he didn't want to continue that same route. He wanted to be different. He decided that, you know, he needed to find some other means of getting to Asia and propose this to the Europeans, other Europeans like Spain and Portugal and even England, right? So, there are two types of people in this world. People who, who can do maths and people who can do maths. Christopher was the one who couldn't do maths. I was joking. You know, maths is for everybody. Well, ignore me. Let's continue. Christopher Columbus, he, though he was a man of logic, that brother could do much to save his life. Let me not say to save his life, that's too drastic. But you'll see why I'm saying this No, Christopher Columbus believed that if you sailed west, if the world was indeed spherical, he would get to Asia. But... But there, there's a but, you know, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. My, that, that makes a lot of sense, you know. But he argued that the circumference of the earth was much smaller than scientists had proposed it to be. So therefore, if he sailed west, not only would the journey be easier but it would be shorter. No, that don't make no sense, bro. That don't make no sense. No sense at all. Because, yeah, you can sail the West, you know, you'll eventually get to Asia. But to say it, it was shorter than the route of um, sailing on the coast of Africa to Asia, seeing that we know what we know now, that's sort of rubbish. <laughs> That don't make no sense. But I'm guessing that they didn't have, you know, as much technology to figure these things out when they were doing this. Now, I believe it's a widely known fact that generally people aren't, people aren't, are just not open to change. So for Little explorer, explorer, and I don't already explore Christopher Columbus to be going to the English and even Portugal Council to tell them that 
scientists are wrong and the journey would be shorter if he sailed west that wasn't sitting well with people so of course he did not get the funding that he wanted from um portugal and england however god answers prayers eh? he went to spain and he proposed this idea to queen elizabeth of Cal um forgive me i just said i'm listening to the audio again and i just said elizabella her name is isabella <laughs> castile and king ferdinand of aragon they were married and they were the monarchs of, of spain at the time but the difference in titles um you know kingdoms of castile of aragon that's a whole different story but if you want, you can read it. It was, they got married in order to um, put together, merge. With, what's the word? Let's say merge the kingdoms of Spain at the time. But, you know, in 1492, that's what we're talking about, the Caribbean. That has nothing to do with the Caribbean, really. So in 1492... They funded his voyage. They funded Christopher Columbus. They gave him the the thing he the things he needed. He needed men. He needed money. He needed a ship. They or ships. They gave him all of those. Of course, they got Spanish names because he was now acting under the crown of Spain. So the deal Christopher Columbus got was that he was whatever lands he would have stumbled upon or valuables he would have gotten 10 percent of the riches he would also earn a noble title in spain as well as governorship of whatever countries or islands or territories he found on the way hypothetically if any were there because they didn't know us that way you know they just know they're going west and they wanted to stumble upon asia all right so if what so if he went that way west yes and found anything he'd get 10 percent of the riches and he would go in governorship of any land he found that was not inhabited having um being ruled by another european yes so Christopher Columbus set sail in 1492 and he landed in uh, in Guanahani in the Bahamas on October 12, 1492 and he found the native Lucayan people there. Of course, this is big, big news for Columbus. He was, I'm calling him a lucky man. He's one lucky man. Too much luck in the story. He was one lucky man. He returned to Spain, taking some of the indigenous people that he found with him. And he returned and he told them what he had found. And of course, people start get ready, eh? You had a lot of green eyed monsters now, you know. Tension started to rise between Spain and Portugal. And in order to combat this, the Treaty of Tordesillas was drawn up by Pope Alexander VI. Now, I believe this is some original scamming going on, you know, because if you look at the picture to the right of the screen, you'll see a first line of demarcation. Um, and that says 1493, but it's, I believe it's supposed to be 1494. The treaty was signed in 1494, June 7. All right. Pope Alexander the Sixth was Spanish, born in Spain. Yes, he was Spanish. And that first line of demarcation that he had set, right, said that in the treaty, the, the countries or the territories west of that line belongs to Spain. And whatever was east of la that line was for Portugal. The things east of that land. A B C where the B C B C B R C. 
there were no territories east of that line. So, you see where the problem came there? So, King John II of Portugal had a major issue with this treaty. So, he disputed it and eventually in 1506, so much years after that, 1506, when Columbus dead and gone, <laughs> 1506, they decided to shift, shift the line of demarcation a couple leagues to the left. And that um, enabled Portugal to obtain the coast of Brazil. So that's why even today, you know, Port um, Brazil was colonized by the Portuguese and they still speak Portuguese even though they gained their independence. So that probably give you a little light or has given you a bit of light to why Brazil is Portuguese while the other countries so close to Brazil speaks a Spanish. No, let's continue. Columbus, Christopher Columbus, had left some of his men in the Caribbean and took some indigenous people back with him to Spain, as I had said, by force, of course. But the queen, Queen Isabella, was pleased with what he had found and ordered that none of these um, indigenous people found in the Caribbean region be harmed because they were now subjects of the Spain crown. Uh, Christopher Columbus returned to, to the Caribbean region in 1494 only to find that all his men were dead. Dead as a doornail. Dead, 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 dead. Not one alive. And uh, they had thought that the, the indigenous people became hostile because maybe these Europeans had overstayed their welcome and it was even proven that they were mistreating them. You no know, shooting at their feet with their guns. That's not right. You're coming to my place and you're going to act like you want to displace me. That's not right. Anyways, Columbus journeyed to the Caribbean twice after that to further scout the territories and see what other valuables he could get. Now, he started to have men settle in the different Caribbean countries. And tension arose between arose between the um the indigenous people and the Europeans at that time, the Spanish, because they were mistreating the indigenous people as well as taking their gold. Um, this had set the scene for colonization by other European forces because when they say cockroach no business not fall fight, they the Treaty of Tordesillas only concerned Spain and Portugal. So the other European countries like France, Britain, you know, Denmark, Danes, you know, they saw the Caribbean as fair game. They could come and take whatever they want if it was if it were by force even. Because the Treaty of Tordesillas did not concern them. It was it was to solve beef between Spain and Portugal. Yes, yeah, so that that as I said set up the scene for colonization because the because the other European countries started coming into the Caribbean and taking over from the Spanish. Now, the introduction of the Africans to the Caribbean. This was because they, they, we're going to talk about the transatlantic slave trade, where they started um, bringing slaves into the Caribbean because the indigenous people were dying. The Europeans had brought a lot of diseases with them that of course, these indigenous people would not have been immune to seeing that they were not exposed to it. They also have different factors like climate and stuff that would make the diseases that they would bring way different from what the indigenous people would have encountered before, right? 
not saying that there weren't any diseases in the Caribbean, just not of the caliber of what the Europeans would have brought. All right. So they were dying. So they needed more people to work on their plantations. And eventually they, they dropped the whole tobacco tree, um, tobacco farming thing because of the U.S. who started to, you know, farm tobacco in Virginia and eventually started to dominate. So they were losing money and they saw that Portuguese, the Portuguese people, Portugal, they were into the whole sugar thing sugarcane farming in brazil and they said let me jump on that bandwagon since there is not not much competition there okay you know it's a business you're running you want to make money ultimately the europeans came to the caribbean in 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 an effort to increase the wealth of their nations however they said that they came for gold for the glory and for god to spread um um the catholic faith because they're catholic now the portuguese dominated the slave trade and that was that was influenced as well by the treaty of Tordesillas, seeing that portugal only got one territory based on that treaty i don't see how that that never turned out in war to be honest that, but the treaty was to avoid war so i guess they just shake hands on it and stuff so the slave trade was dominated by the portuguese however in the 1600s the english became the f um, front runners in this business because as they said as i said the british believed that the and the other european countries believed that the caribbean would be fair game would be fair you can take whatever they want because the treaty of Tordesillas did not concern them at all so tell me something Slavery was already a major part in the European culture as they had Jewish slaves and they even had Moors, right? They were whites in Europe used as slaves. So if they already had slaves, why did they choose to cap capture Africans? Why did they move to move down to the Africa, go so far in Africa to come to get people to come work in the Caribbean? And I said, get people like they're recruiting them. No, they take them, they, they kidnap them, stuff like that because i believe it's because of the different climates they believe that it would the blacks would be more able to work in the sun than the whites so if they took the jewish slaves and the moors which are mainly white they don't think they would survive in the caribbean region slaves were taken through the middle passage in terrible condi conditions and this led to revolts in the, on the ships and even when they got to the caribbean there were revolts on these plantations we learn more about those and we go through riots revolts and revolutions slaves were brought to the caribbean as i said because the indigenous people were dying they were dying like dropping like flies dying The transatlantic slave trade, though, it did not only include the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is just the route from Africa to the Americas in order to carry the slaves. But you had the route from, from Europe to Africa, where they would bring money, gold, and stuff of that sort in order to buy, buy goods as well as goods goods meaning slaves they bought the normal goods where you can go and market and shop go buy but the other goods were slaves as well then you had the the route from the from africa to the americas and that's the middle passage where they brought the slaves into the caribbean region and the americas then you had the trip back from the from the americas to europe bringing gold and other things that they would have gotten other valuables and even some slaves back with them so yes that's the transatlantic trade now the introduction of the 
Asians. The arrival of the Asians came during the, t- the time of indentureship or apprenticeship. Now, a plural society was now created in the Caribbean as there were a diversity of ethnic groups which resided here. The Chinese and the Indians came to the West Indies to work on the sugar plantations. However, they, they didn't like the work conditions. So as soon as their contracts had, had ended, they left the plantations in order to open up shops. And we are seeing this very prominently in the Caribbean where the Chinese and the Indians have opened so many enterprises in the Caribbean region. The, chi- the How the Chinese and the Indians came though, they came... They weren't forced, but given the type of people that they would pray on, they'd pray on the very poor, the starving, and say, come work in the Caribbean, you'll get money. So you could send money back to your family, help out a bit, get yourself a better life. That's what they were promoting to these people. So, you know, when you have nothing taking something seems better than still having nothing so of course they would take these jobs and come to the caribbean the indentureship or apprenticeship um was introduced in 18 um was introduced because in 1833 the act to abolish slavery in the british colonies was passed and it took effect in 1834 so in 1834 um british colonies were no longer allowed to have slaves by 1838 apprenticeship had ended now where there is a mixture of ethnic groups there will always be hybridization so why start fondling with blacks when when they brought the africans into the caribbean as slaves so Slaves were raped, things like that happened, and their offspring were called mulatto. They're a mixture of whites and black. In the mixture of the Spanish you now with the indigenous people were called mestizos. Um, the Africans and Indians, a mixture of that when indentureship was introduced, you know, and they started, the Indians started like actually taking residence in the Caribbean region. The, the, the offspring or posterity, that's a new word, posterity, of um, these African and in Africans and Indians called Dugla. And if you're a quarter black with, say, some white or some other race you're quadroon or if you're one eighth you're one eighth black you're octoroon and if you're octoroon or quadroon that's one eighth black or quarter black and you mix with a white you're called a musty so that's it you know go over i know it was a mouthful but this these are quite interesting things that happened so if you're hearing this once again you've made it to the end of the video congratulations like subscribe drop your thoughts in the comments let's have a chat let's have a discussion let's hear your ideas as to why so many of these things happened ask questions let us answer them let us discuss let's get bougie in the comment section also go follow me on instagram link is in the description and i will not hold on should i i'm i'm undecided yet if i should continue this powerpoint and have it on the entire historical process or if i should just drop what i have now on this powerpoint in the description but if it's there that means i decided to put it there if not i decided to continue until i you know finish the entire historical process so yeah that's it until next time look out for the next video I'm also thinking of doing some communication studies, but let's see how my days go because 
this online school, this life ain't it, but we have to make it work.